your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and when you find that, if you would stand tonight, you've been sitting a while, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, we're going to read this together, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, thank you Charlie for leading the songs, thank you Tia for playing, thank you Brother Jonathan for playing the guitar, very soon we are going to be having our audio uh, upgrade, that'll be a blessing, we should be able to hear the instruments much better through the sound system. Also, by, I want to welcome those of you that are joining us by way of live stream and online. Uh, God willing, you'll be able to hear the instruments much better in the future going forward after our upgrade. I do want to also mention this when you find Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10, before we do that, I want to thank those that are participating in our Options for Women bottle drive to help this pro-life organization. Um, that is, uh, um, their main center is in Cherry Hill, helping, uh, I think their main center in Cherry Hill is about three blocks from one of the biggest abortion clinics in South Jersey, and they're starting another center in Trenton. I mentioned this morning, a church, I, I looked, uh, I got to see uh, online this last week, a church gave $100,000, and I don't know the name of the church, $100,000 to help them start that second center. To God be the glory, Amen. Now, think about it. You say, Hunter, that's a huge... It is, but when you think about a building, okay, you think about a location in Trenton. I mean, $100,000 is a lot of money, but, you know, really, right? There's, there's huge needs, in other words. And so, so to God be the glory, it's awesome. And so don't forget, um, and I want to thank those of you that are online joining us. Some of you have sent in, you've dropped off uh, either uh, donations. Some of you have sent donations from out of state. I want to thank you. And don't forget... Next week, bring these back. So it's next Sunday. Next Sunday is the last Sunday. I need you to bring those back, uh, coins, cash, and or check uh, to put in here. If you write a check, make sure it's made out to options for women. I want to thank everybody there. Ecclesiastes 10, we're going to just read verses 1 through 11. I think that's what I have here. And we'll read responsibly like we do on Sunday morning. And then I'll pray and you can be seated tonight. I'll begin in verse 1. Dead flies caused the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place. For yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. And let's read verse 11 together. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. I'm going to preach a message tonight entitled, Folly or Wisdom? Which is it for you? I'm going to ask some questions tonight through this message, and I want you to ask yourself these questions, these questions that uh, are kind of brought about by the text here that Solomon uh, brings to us in chapter 10. Let's pray, and then you can be seated. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for every person that's physically here. I'm thankful for those that are joining us by way of live stream. I thank you for your word. I thank you for what it means to me, what it means to the people in this church, what it means to those that are watching. I, I don't think they'd be watching if the Bible did not mean something to them. And God, I pray that during this Christmas season, and it's, and it's a little bit busier for everybody. It really is. I uh, the, the Christmas cards, perhaps decorations, uh, uh, maybe the baking of cookies, uh, maybe having people over. And even this year, maybe if things are, are a little bit different and maybe not as many of those things go on, there's, there's more traffic. There's, Lord, it, it is a little busier time of the year, regardless to what extent we celebrate Christmas. But I pray 
regardless of the busyness, that we would stay faithful to spend time in your word. We'd be faithful to be in your house when the church doors are open. God, please be with those that um, still that are affected by this COVID. I continue to pray for the leaders in our country, give them wisdom, the health leaders and those rolling out, uh, trying to do what they can. And Lord, we don't understand it all. And, and, and Lord, really, the truth of the matter is some of us are, we, we question things. We, we don't know exactly what the truth is with everything, but we're praying for the health of our neighbors, our friends, especially those that perhaps are struggling. All of us have heard of different people. I know friends that have people up in years that, um, Lord, COVID at least has been a contributing factor to their death. And, and God, I just pray uh, that our country could get back to a, a normalcy. But during all of this, please, God, arrest hearts. Uh, Lord, may people look to you. When people don't understand, would they, Lord, look uh, to your word? Would they think about maybe the one Christian they know in their life, that, that one born-again believer, maybe a coworker, maybe a, a neighbor in the community, perhaps a family member that they would reach out to and they would say, hey, life is just doesn't make sense and I, I need some direction and I need some answers and I, I believe you have them. And I pray that we would be ready to answer a, 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 a reason of the hope that lieth in us. Now, God bless this message tonight. Help us to listen to pay attention and to receive the truth and to ask ourselves, wisdom or folly, which is the road that I'm on? And help us to choose wisely, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated tonight. This chapter begins with vivid imagery in the first verse. I mean, dead flies. It starts with dead flies. You look at verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary, the good-smelling uh, aroma, if you will, to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You know, something that smells good turned nasty by some dead in insects. And, and wisdom is a sweet thing. A, a good reputation is such a blessing. By the way, it takes a long time to build a good reputation. It can take just a quick moment to ruin that reputation. I mean, it, it, you can build a reputation for a long time, and then it can just go out the door. You add a little bit of a, a, a foolishness, a little dash of folly, and everything turns sour because uh, foolishness stinks. All it takes is one rash word, one rude remark, one hasty decision, or one foolish pleasure, or one angry outburst to spoil everything. As Derek Kidner, in his very small commentary, I actually have it in my office. I've got several commentaries on the book of Ecclesiastes. He said this, it is easier to make a stink than to create sweetness. That's true, amen? Any of you have children, you know that's true also. <clears throat> but for much of this book in Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon has been singing the praises of wisdom. He's been directing us to live in such a way, the way of wisdom. And in this chapter, he turns his focus from wisdom and he warns us, get this now, of folly. Now, let me just stop and say something here. The truth, the truth, the truth, I want you to realize this, the truth always gives us the good and warns us of the bad. Let me just say that again. The truth will always give the good and warn of the bad. Now, this is applicable to every area of life. Go and learn to be a crane operator. A good teacher will teach you the right way to operate the crane, all of the ins and outs of the operation, but that teacher will also warn you of the improper ways to use that crane, the danger that you could expose yourself and others if you don't operate that thing properly. Go and learn to be an electrician. You'll learn the cardinal truths of electricity and the good that can come when you wire a house or business properly. You'll learn the laws of electricity. The right electrical school will also teach you and warn you of the wrong way to handle electricity. What could happen if you're not grounded properly and if you don't respect electricity? It's the same thing in marriage. 
A wise counselor will apprise a husband and wife of all the blessings and the good that comes from marriage. That same counselor will also be very upfront and warn that couple about marriage. That marriage will shake you up. It will expose your selfishness and will, if you will allow it, help to make you more like Christ than nearly anything else in this world. A good a counselor, a premarital counselor won't say, oh, everything will just be roses and wonderful thing. Uh, tiptoeing through the, the daisies as you feast on your love uh, every morning. Okay. No. Okay. No. Now, marriage is wonderful. I love it. We just celebrate 24 years. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful thing. But, but here again, it's that, it's that balanced approach. A good church, a, a good pastor, a, a good teacher will lift up and share the great truths about Jesus Christ and his salvation and eternal life that can be had if we but repent and trust Christ as Savior. But that same teacher or preacher or church will strongly warn the Christian who, warn, who runs off into fornication. Will strongly warn the person who gossips about other Christians. You know, God hates gossip. If you're involved in gossip, stop it. Amen. Whether you're listening by live stream or whether you're here. Hey, uh, that same uh, preacher will strongly warn those who imbibe in their drunkenness. Uh, and so uh, think about this. Hey, we need, to, uh, we need to talk about the good, but we also warn. And this is what Solomon's doing. He's saying, hey, live in the way of wisdom. But let me warn you now about folly, about foolishness. And Solomon pivots from wisdom to folly. And he warns us throughout this chapter In this part of Ecclesiastes, he doesn't necessarily construct an argument all through the chapter. It's more like Proverbs almost. It's it's like short stories, uh, maxims, Proverbs, comparisons, exhortations. And so uh, all through it, Solomon is going to give two different ways he contrasts about ways to live, the wise way and the way of folly. And so as we work through the passage tonight, the question I want you to ask yourself is this, am I living wisely or foolishly? And it's vital to know the, dis- the difference between wisdom and folly. Now, most Christians that I speak with can distinguish between good and evil. It's pretty easy. Between right and wrong, okay? Uh, we know things that are morally light, right. For the most part, we know what is morally wrong. And we try to do the right things instead of the wrong thing- things. But some of the most important choices in life are not between good and evil, but between wisdom and folly. This is very important to understand this. And to understand the difference, you've got to know the biblical definition of folly. Now, a fool in the biblical sense is not necessarily someone with below average intelligence. No, no, folly does not always show up on the low end of the IQ scale. No, the term refers to someone who lacks the proper fear of God and therefore is prone to go the wrong direction in life. It's the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. Now, now, To be fair, uh, folly is often closely associated with wickedness. I understand that. But folly is not exactly the same thing as wickedness. Many wicked people are deliberately malicious. But the fool, get this now, is characterized instead by impulsive disobedience, by self-centered arrogance, by rash disregard for the holiness of God, kind of living by their feelings, kind of just uh, rushing into things. And, and the preacher has already told us a lot of things in Ecclesiastes about the fool already. Among them, let me show them on the screen just as kind of a review, he, that this person is morally blind. He, he is lazy. His life is not pleasing to God. He is ill-tempered. Uh, he refuses to take advice. And so here in verse 2 of chapter 10, the preacher adds something about the fool. He is directionally challenged. Look at verse 2. A wise man's heart is at his what? Right hand, but a fool's heart is at his what? Now, now this is not, I know what some of you have done to left-handed people you don't like. See, God God likes right-handed people. Now, this is not anything to do with right-handed people and left-handed people. Okay, so with apologies to the left-handers, the Bible generally treats the right side as the good side. As, and, and he's not talking here again right hand, left hand, as far as uh, like your right hand is the, is the better hand. Left, no, no, no. Uh, let, let me give you a quote here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Michael Eaton, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, said the right hand was associated with the strength which saves, supports, and protects. And he's talking about in the Bible on the whole. The, the right hand is always associated with authority. You read Colossians 3.1. Where is Jesus seated? The right hand 
of the Father, okay? This, you see this throughout the Bible. And so you, you, you think about this. If you study this out, it's not surprising. The final judgment, the sheep will be on the right hand and the what on the left? What's on the left hand? Anybody remember? The goats, sheep and the goats, okay? The sheep are those that are Christians. The goats are the unsaved. And, and so when the preacher says the fool is on the left, therefore he's telling us that this is the man or the woman going the wrong direction in life. So I ask you tonight, which direction are you going in life? Are you moving toward temptation or away from temptation? Are you moving the right way in discipleship and learning God's word? Hey, has 2020, have you increased in your love for God's word or has it decreased? Are you falling away spiritually? Are you drawing closer to the people of God or are you going off by yourself kind of like on an island? Only a fool would go the wrong direction in life. And I want you to notice the reason why a fool goes this way. It's because his heart is leaning in the wrong direction. Look at verse 2. A wise man's what is at his left hand? His heart. Now the heart's the core of a person's being, the inside part of every person that either loves or does not love God. I taught the young people in the junior disciples today, there are some things that you can do too much of. I said, what happens when you eat too much? And all the young people gave different answers if you ate too much. One kid, one, 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 uh, one child says, yeah, you can get too fat. Uh, and everybody laughed. But, but, you know, there's other things. You could you can become sick. Uh, you can puke. One, one, one child said you could puke. Uh, and there's different things. I, I asked, what happens if you shop too much? And there were some good answers. And, and we went through some, some of the different things. But you know what I said? There's one thing, you know, you cannot do too much of. You can't love God too much. We taught Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart. And with all, I had them stretch out their hands as wide as they could. I said, get, stretch out your hands. I said, you can never love God too much. And the heart is that inside part of every person. Charles Bridges defined the heart as the center of affection, the seat of knowledge, the source of purpose and emotion, the very soul of the spiritual life. And everything in life follows the heart. Get this now. The wise person goes the right way. Why? Because his heart leans the right way. But the wicked man's heart leans in the opposite direction. The foolish person leans in the opposite direction because that's where his heart's heading. And wisdom and folly are really just inclinations of the heart. Which way are your spiritual feet pointing? You know, wherever your feet are pointing, that's where you generally go. You know, your feet pointed in the church tonight. That's why you came in the church. I didn't see anybody walking in backwards. You know, in life, wherever your feet are pointing, that's where. And so your, your heart, wherever your heart is leaning, that's where you're going to. You know, you hear about these great falls, about people that do these just stupid or crazy or insane or, or very wicked things. And you say, how in the world did that person do that? Their heart was already heading in that direction. Long before the fall ever happened, their heart was already that way. It was already leaning that way. And so I ask you some more questions tonight. Which way is your heart leaning? Toward God or away from him? Do you have a growing appetite for the word of God? Or does the Bible taste stale to you? How many ever tasted a piece of stale bread before? You, ever still? you know what's worse than a piece of stale bread? A stale chip. It's disgusting. Let me ask you. Does the Bible taste like a stale chip to you? Now, don't answer out loud. But, but in other words, is it just like you just kind of like, eh? It's just, it really doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. Um, are you moving toward or away from God in prayer? Are you getting more serious about addressing your sin? And when I say your sin, that one sin that trips you up more than anything else in your life, and it's different for every person here. Or have you stopped pursuing personal sanctification? It is so important to understand that the leaning of your heart determines the direction of your life. And so the fool is on the, the wrong road completely, but sadly, he or she doesn't even realize it. Look at verse 3. Look at this. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. He doesn't even realize it. And then look at the, the rest of the verse. And he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Well, what does this verse mean? It means that the fool's walking along, not only knowing that he or she is walking foolishly, uh, 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 not, not know, knowing, but his or her decisions are broadcasting to everyone who sees them that they are a fool. That's what it says at the end of verse 3. And he, he saith to everyone, he's not walking around saying, I'm a fool. His actions are saying to everybody, I'm a fool. Look at me. 
You ever known anybody, you look at, you stand back and you say, I can't believe they're doing what they're doing. Anybody ever known anybody like that? I, I can think of some people right now, the way they are living their life. I mean, these are people I know. These are people I love. Every, the decisions they're making, you know what they're, they, it's like, they might as well have a, mega, a megaphone. I'm living like a fool, everybody. They are. They're broadcasting it to everybody by the way they live and the decisions they make. They're just saying, uh, they, they, he's saying it to everyone that he's a fool. You see, fools have a way of refusing to listen to good advice. Look at the verse on the screen, Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his what? Own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And in addition, a fool has a way of doing something that shouts, I'm a fool. Look at Proverbs 13, 16 on the screen. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. A fool's like, ah, here it is. You know what I've seen? And some of you aren't in, uh, on social media, but this is what I've seen. I've seen some that have turned from God on social media. They just get on social media and they just let it all hang out. They're just they're they're they're, they're sick and tired of their upbringing from God, and they uh, they've rebelled against their parents, and they've just basically said it all. I don't care what anybody thinks, and they just say it. You know what? They they are a they are a perfect example of Ecclesiastes ten three. It's like they they just have fulfilled the Bible. I want to say to them, boy, you you, you are a very good case of uh, illustration of the Bible. And I think, what a sad thing. What a, what a sad thing. And so the application of these verses is simple. Don't be a fool. And God gives us these juxtapositions, if you will, these opposites so that we can choose how to live. He says, hey, here's the way of wisdom. Here's the way of folly. What are you going to do? And I implore you tonight, do not be the kind of person who refuses to listen to constructive criticism. Don't be the kind of person who ignores what godly people are trying to say. Don't be the kind of person who erupts with anger every time something goes wrong. Instead, turn your heart toward God and ask him to give you grace to choose the right path and not the wrong path, to choose his way and not your way. And that's hard to do. Some, in other words, it's hard to, to choose. It's not always so apparent, especially if we get wrapped up in situations in our life. Now, in addition to telling us how to avoid folly ourselves, the preacher also tells us how to respond to the folly in the lives of others. Now, see, I know what some of you are thinking. Uh, Pastor Josh, it would be so much easier if I didn't have to deal with these dumbbells all day long, you know? I know what some of you are thinking. Yeah, I, I'd do okay if I didn't have to, you know, uh, be with all these people that, uh, you know, are, are, are just a little bit, you know, well, never mind. I better not say what I'm thinking, right? Verses 1 through 3 define the, the, the difference between wisdom and folly. Verses 4 through 7 gives us practical advice for dealing with the foolish people we meet in the world. There are many foolish people around. Um, people who do not fear God, they live for themselves, and sooner or later we get frustrated with their folly. You know anybody like this? You just get frustrated. Uh, some of us live with fools, uh, and their foolish behavior disrupts the life of our home. Some of us work with fools, and, and their laziness or their selfish demands, or their erratic decision-making make the workplace miserable, especially if that someone is in a place of authority or someone that is a boss of yours. And then there are all the fools in government. Most Americans at least can relate to one of Mark Twain's. And if you're familiar at all with Mark Twain, uh, he was very witty. And uh, he didn't particularly like government or people that worked in the government. But this is what he said. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I thought it was kind of funny. He said, suppose you were an idiot. And suppose you were a member of Congress. But I repeat myself. Okay, now, that's kind of funny, okay? Now, now, it might be a little over the top, Twain might be, but, but it is in keeping with what Ecclesiastes says about political leadership. Look at verse 5. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses in princes walking as servants upon the earth. Now, unfortunately, I believe it's been since the dawn of time, there are many foolish people in government. And as foolish as they are, they nonetheless managed to work their way into positions of political leadership or they knew someone that knew someone, right? Isn't that what a lot of politics is about? Some are completely incompetent while others use their position for personal advantage. By the way, it doesn't matter the party. It doesn't matter the party. Every... every Every year, there's, there's people on the right and people on the left that get exposed for different things. Happens. Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents, it doesn't matter. I see it, and I think, because some people say, well, see, look, th this one part, it's all, they're all corrupt. Well, then, then in the next week, I, I remember when um, uh, Newt Gingrich, 
Newt Gingrich was blasting Bill Clinton for being uh, for the whole scandal with Monica Lewinsky. The following year, it was found out he was having an affair with someone on his own, you know, against his own wife. He was he was the he had the he had the political high ground against Bill Clinton. Oh, I can't believe Bill Clinton, what a low sleazeball! And yet he was doing the same thing. He was conservative. I mean, I, I from from as far as ideals, as far as conservative uh, politics, I would I would more align with Newt Grant Gingrich, but but it was much a scandal in his life. And some in government, not all, uh, are interested in status more than service. And, and often by the time their folly is exposed, it's too late. The damage has been done. Because when the wrong people get into power, everything gets turned upside down. In verse 5, the preacher says that errors in leadership produce evil in society as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. And then he uh, describes some of the bad things that happen. There in, in verse 6, the rich sit in low place. Now, this is not the, the filthy rich finally getting put in their place. It means that people with financial resources don't have the power to use them for public good. In verse 7, how many of you ever seen, I, I thought about Mark, when thinking about Mark Twain, how many of you ever seen that old either movie or read the book, uh, The Prince and the Pauper? You, you remember that? You know, when, when uh, two boys, which look similar, they switch places, one, one was the pauper, and one was the prince, and they, they completely switch, okay? Um, in biblical times, horses were only owned by the wealthy or those in power. They were associated with power and wealth and royal authority, and slaves generally did not ride in horseback. They were the ones that walked in front or behind their masters. But when folly sits on the throne, everything is topsy-turvy. Slaves ride while princes walk. And when, whenever we see things turned upside down, whenever society celebrates immorality, United States of America, uh, whenever a society perpetuates wrongful violence uh, or punishes righteousness, the man who was doing undercover videos uh, for Planned Parenthood, who was trying to sell baby parts, is being prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, probably going to be put in jail for years, especially if this Yahoo, and he is a Yahoo who, who uh, Biden might put in um, as the Health and Human Services, he is the most, he's, the, he's a butcher. He, he, he is for abortion to the max. And by the way, uh, and I'm going to say it, and I'll do it respectfully, and I'll pray for them if they end up being president, and, and Mrs. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris was the attorney general that prosecuted this guy that this, um, he is a pro-life, very, and I can't remember his name right now, um, but uh, he's right now, it's, it's, it's in trial, and it doesn't look good for him. It doesn't look good for him. Uh, uh, and, and he was trying to do something right. Uh, whenever we see things, uh, uh, a society that denies the authority of God or persecutes his people, we may be sure that folly is in control. Now, how should we respond? You say, preacher, how should we respond? Now, the preacher's answer may surprise you. We skipped over a verse, but it's found in verse 4. I want you to look at it. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy what? Thy place. For yielding pacifieth great offenses. Now, let me just stop. I'm going to just focus on this for a little bit. Rather than running away from tyranny or taking the law into our own hands or claiming we have a right to be angry or saying we do not have to obey, obey a foolish government, the preacher recommends a calm and quiet response that turns away wrath. This is the biblical way to deal with fools, not by sharing in their folly, but get this now, by living out the character of Christ. Verse 4 describes a bad-tempered leader who gets mad at one of his officials. And rather than getting angry about this or walking away as a matter of principle, the official, Solomon says, should stick to his post and speak words of gentle wisdom. And I would submit to you tonight, if you follow me for a moment, the same counsel applies to many other situations in life. Now, Solomon is not condoning verbal abuse, nor is he ever saying there's never a time for people in authority to put down a tyrant or for someone to walk away from a fight. There are those times. But the preacher is saying here that ordinarily the best response to anger is to stay, not to run away. To stay calm, not to get angry. Getting angry would only make things worse. Derek Kidner, in that small commentary I referred to earlier, he said this, it's better to have only one angry person than to have two. 
Now, this is good counsel for workers with an angry boss. It's good counsel for students with an angry teacher or for parents with an angry child and for wives with an angry husband or vice versa. Just because someone else gets upset does not mean that you and I have the right to walk away from a relationship, especially if that relationship is ordained by God and is sealed with the promise the way marriage is. And the way to deal with foolish anger is not to be intimidated by it or to respond in kind, but to keep calm, which we can only do by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what's very tempting to do when someone gets angry? It's tempting to say, I'm not going to take it anymore. Now, admittedly, there are times when Christians are called to leave a bad work situation. Maybe God's calling you to move on. Or when we have biblical grounds for separation and divorce. Or when we need to hold an angry person accountable so that the the poor fool, and I would call that person a poor fool, can get the help he or she needs. But even then, we should act calmly and carefully rather than angrily and hastily. And so usually the wise thing to do is to remain in the situation. There are some of you that have been involved in churches before. And at times you felt like, man, I should just really leave. This is a bad situation. But some of you just decided to stay. And you're glad you just decided to stay and just work your way through it. And then there are those who would just bounce around from church to church because some little thing happened. I want to encourage you. Look at this principle here. If the spirit of the ruler rises up against thee, leave not thy place for yielding. And now there are times where God will move us on from things. But here again, ordinarily, staying calm is part of God's winning strategy for dealing with foolish anger. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter gives us some, a similar um, example here. And, and Peter, he, had, he, he, he deals with some people that were a struggle to deal with. He knew what it was like to deal with angry people. 1 Peter 2, like the fools who told him to stop preaching the gospel. In the book of Acts. Here in 1 Peter 2 in in verses 13 through 15. He told Christians to submit to the governing authorities. Even when they were persecuting the church. Because by doing good needs the suffering church would. Get this now. Look at the scripture verses there. Put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He told servants in verses 18 through 19. To respect their masters even if they were unjust. Because it's, it's, it's a gracious thing to endure injustice in verses 18 through 19. In chapter 3, he tells wives to submit to their husbands even if they're unsaved. So that with the right conduct, the conversation, which means way of life, that their husband would be won by the proper response of the believing wife. Now, if, if we doubt the wisdom of Peter's counsel, we think it's impossible for us to follow, then... I want you to look in 1 Peter 2 at the prime example Peter gives us. And this is a passage all of us would do well to learn. Why should we keep serving people who make us suffer? Now look at verse 21. 1 Peter 2, 21. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also what for us? Suffered for us, leaving us an example. Isn't that interesting? Leaving us an example. That ye should follow his what? His steps. Now, those steps were steps of suffering. It doesn't mean being being put necessarily on the cross. And Peter points out here what Jesus did. He, he, He did exactly what Ecclesiastes tells us to do. Angry rulers rose against him. Foolish men who treated him with contempt until finally they crucified him. Jesus refused to to be dissuaded from what, he, what God had called him to do. He, he, he refused to fight anger with anger, and he calmly did the work he was called to do. Have you ever considered all of the anger and the foolish behavior that on the way to the cross Jesus put up with, and not only put up with, but either didn't respond to or responded in love? Now, I want you to look at verse 23. Look at this. Who, when he was reviled, this is talking about Jesus, Reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Boy, that's, that's amazing. By, by, by Christ's calm response, Jesus, boy, he went to the cross. He, he, he carried our sins upon the cross and he forgave everyone. Uh, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what we do. And by the way, those of us who will put our trust in him, he forgives all, uh, all our sin, including, I believe, some of the very men who crucified him. I can't prove it for certain, but I believe 
the centurion uh, placed his faith and trust in Christ that day, the one who said, truly, this is the Son of God. Now, I, I can't prove that. I can't tell you emphatically 100%. And Jesus calls us to follow in his footsteps. And so here's the question for you. Who is the angry or foolish person in your life? And how will you respond? How are you going to respond? If you constantly respond by running away. Now, here again, there's a time where God would call us to, 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 to walk away. And there's a time where God would say, okay, en- enough with that. And, and maybe that in certain circumstances, that relationship. But, but what are you, how are you going to respond? I, I believe... Uh, is so often God would say, okay, just stay, be calm. Now, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. As we continue on chapter 10, the preacher gives us further encouragement for wise living when he tells us that folly is self-destructive. Look in verses 8 and 9. And he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh in the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso remove the stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Now, what is Solomon telling us? See? Is he telling us that just to be careful? You know, the world's not a safe place. I mean, we know that. I, I, and if we're wise, we'll watch out for danger. I mean, uh, an innocent person maybe is engaged in his occupation and he's accidentally injured. And uh, these illustrations right here in verses 8 and 9, they're just people who are simply doing their jobs. You could say, and they fall prey to the dangers that perhaps are in their occupation. I know, Brother Mike, and you're in your role, and, 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 and Brother Jonathan, in your role there uh, working on airplanes and some of the rest of you, depending on the, what you do, Brother Charlie, what you used to do, um, there, there are a lot of safety things. And, boy, you got to be very, very careful. And, and, and you might be saying, well, it's just accidental. Uh, they're not punishments for bad behavior. And, and, and since it's not mentioned, it's just mentioned so the wise person can avoid them. And, and you know, we, we could look at it that way. But I believe there's something else that God's trying to tell us here. The end of chapter 9 and most of chapter 10 about wisdom and folly. Um, I believe the foolish man, and maybe even evil, fell into his own pit. In other words, this was not an accident of misfortune. This was an act of divine justice. God says, okay, you're going to do that to try to injure somebody else. It's going to come back to you, okay? Uh, Something similar happens to the man who knocks down the wall, heedless of danger, breaking a boundary that was never meant to be broken. Folly can be deadly, trying to hurt someone else. In the words of Charles Bridges, the old-time commentator, evil shall fall upon the heads of its own authors. And I believe for every folly, there's an equal and opposite self-destruction. Think about the addict who seeks the calm of the drink or the thrill of the hit but ends up wasting away or killing themselves. I think about, um, I remember when I was just, just had started watching um, like uh, sports and I was just getting, I was, I was young and I think if I remember right, uh, you could, some of you could look it up, it was either the 1980 or the 1982 NBA draft. And the, see, I was a big Lakers fan growing up. I was born in Los Angeles and of course I grew up in Montana, but I was born there and in the 80s, the Lakers are really good, and Magic Johnson, all these. Well, the Celtics had uh, acquired in the draft a, a phenomenal player by the name of Len Bias. Either 1980 or 1982. So I was either 8 or 10. I don't remember. You'd have to look it up. Len Bias. First game, if I'm not mistaken, as a rookie professional, just signed a big contract. He fell over dead in the middle of the basketball court. Died of a heart attack in the middle of his first game. They found out the night before he was doing cocaine. Night before. Had his whole life ahead of him. I'll never forget it. I was just, I remember I was just starting to watch sports and I heard, and I heard this. And I was like, wow, this is just unreal. The addict who, who, who seeks the, you know, the thrill of the hit. Uh, the lusty sinner that wants sexual pleasure, but by gratifying that desire outside the holy bonds of matrimony, ends up spiritually unsatisfied and goes further and further deeper uh, until they're just completely ashamed of themselves. The selfish husband or wife who wants to have things his or her own way, but in trying to get it ruins the relationship and loses everything. The angry father or mother wants more control, but angry emotions set everyone in the household on edge, which only leads to more chaos and more anger and ultimately less control. Some of the pitfalls of folly. Hey, dig the pit. You're going to fall in. Break down the wall and the snake of sin will come back to bite you. And there's a wiser and safer way to live, but it'll take some patience. 
And Solomon shows this by giving us a couple of analogies in the next couple of verses, the last two we're going to look at tonight. One from a blacksmith and one from a snake charmer. Look in verse 10, 11. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge. Hey, if your axe is not sharp, if it's dull and you don't sharpen it, then must he put to more strength. In other words, you just got to keep hitting more and more and more. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Now, verse 10 compares wisdom to a sharpened blade as it takes more strength to wield an axe or a sword when the blade is dull, and it cuts something in two, a person has to keep hacking away at it. And so what is Solomon doing? He's saying this is exactly the way foolish people live. Follow me now. They keep flailing away at their work or their relationships without ever making much progress, especially spiritually. And so what is Solomon doing? He says it would be wiser to sharpen the edge of the blade so it can slice through something with a single blow. In other words, if we're wise, we will take the time to prepare our blade for life. It takes time to sharpen the saw. It takes time to sharpen the sword. But boy, it'll help you in life. This principle applies to quite a few areas of life. Let me just put a few of them up here tonight and we'll... I'll just talk about them for just a minute. We'll be done. Education. Education. Hey, young people, take the time now to sharpen your minds. Learn now. You will be thankful someday. Be sure to get the best training, sharpening skills for effective service in the kingdom of God. Hey, whatever it is God wants you to do in your life right now, learn to the best of your ability. Hey, if you are in school and you are getting uh, grades, C grades, but you could get B grades, Shame on you. Sharpen your sword. Get better grades. All of you. All of you. Anybody that's going to school, even college students. Kenzie, you're here tonight. I'm preaching to you too, okay? Do that. I think about relationships. A prudent courtship is far more likely to lead to a more successful marriage than a whirlwind romance. This is important. In other words, take some time to prepare for that relationship, especially when it comes to marriage. I think about ministry. And and I don't mean full-time ministry necessarily, although it could apply. Before starting a new endeavor for God, make sure your quote, quote, blade is sharpened for the work of God. Make sure whatever God wants you to do in your life or a ministry in the church that God would want you to start or, or embark upon. I think about business, business. Make sure the blade of character, if you will, in your life is sharpened. Character and hard work will take you much further than talent ever will. It will. Character and hard work. I ask you tonight, how sharp is your blade? Are you hacking away at life like a fool or staying on the sharp age of wisdom? Living wisely may take more time at the beginning, but it saves time in the long run. Now, I want to close with verse 11. It's a little more difficult to kind of understand, but I believe verse 11 kind of makes the opposite point of verse 10. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it, and then I'll just bring the two together and we'll be done. Here the danger in verse 11 lies in acting too slowly. One who is able to handle a difficult matter, that's a charmer. How many of you ever seen either in movies? I've never seen in person. Maybe you've been to a country where they do snake charming. You ever, you ever, anybody ever seen that or familiar with that or read about that? I'm not too familiar with it, but this is what this is speaking about here. The one who is able to handle a difficult matter, a charmer, fails for lack of being prompt, being quick. The serpent bites before it's charmed. The serpent will bite without enchantment. You see, once a snake is charmed, it can be kept under control, but until then, it's very dangerous. And so it's very important uh, for a snake charmer to get busy and charm the snake before it bites because it'd be deadly for the snake charmer. In other words, foolish delay will come back to bite you. And so you take these verses together, verse 10 And verse 11, it shows us why you and I need wisdom from God. Sometimes it's important to take more time to prepare. Other times we need to act before it's too late. Do you understand this? Wisdom comes in knowing the difference. Sometimes you got to act quickly. Certain things in life you need to take things slower. Ovid, O-V-I-D, he was the famous Roman or one of the famous Roman poets He's reported to have said this, and I have it up here for you. At times it is folly to hasten, at other times to delay. The wise do everything in its proper time, 
Thus the wise person is never early and never late, but always right on time. Now, I believe this timely wisdom comes just from life experience, some of it. Some of it comes from talking with people who are wiser and get this now, usually older than we are. That's why it's important not to put older people on the back burner. You know, people that are up in years have a lot of wealth and experience and wisdom that we don't. You notice I included we with the, young, with the younger, amen? But the best way to gain true spiritual wisdom is by listening to the words of Jesus. Turn to Matthew 7. Just, we're not going to, I'm not going to do a study on it, but I just want you to see. Like Solomon of Ecclesiastes, Jesus knew the difference between wisdom and folly. Now we're going to close with this little, just these last words of Jesus here at the end of chapter 7, Matthew 7. He told a story to show the difference between a wise man and a foolish man. Matter of fact, we sing a song about it. You know, the wise man built his, the foolish man built his. Okay, now look at Matthew 7, verse 24. We see the wise man first. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a what? A rock, wise man, he took the time and he prepared and he sunk some anchors in that rock. And when the difficulties and the struggles and the trials, uh, when it came, it didn't say uh, if the rain, it says and the rain descended and the floods came. They'll come, they will come in life, they're coming for you. But the foolish man was much less fortunate because look in verse 26, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not should be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. It didn't, it didn't take much for him. He didn't really build a foundation. He just kind of built it right in the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell. And not only did it fall, it was a disaster. Great was the fall of it. Jesus not only believed there was a difference between wisdom and folly, he also believed it was the difference between life and death. What was the difference? The wise man built his house upon the rock. What did the rock represent? The rock represents the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid. Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life upon the rock. Receive Christ as your Savior for the foundation is the rock and then build your life according to here, here now the blueprints upon that foundation. I was, uh, we'll close with this. I was, when I first moved here in 2013, I was helping Pastor Fish, but it was just on a part-time basis, and I had to get a full-time job, and I found a job in downtown Philly. Well, when I was working at, right on Market Street, downtown Philly, I know, Brother Mike, you work downtown a lot of times, uh, but uh, the building that I was in, and I can't remember the name of the building, it was, uh, I think it was the 2800 block uh, I think it's the BNY Mellon Center. Uh, but I could see from, it was the different floors, 28th floor and different floors, I could see them building a, um, it, it took a long time. I, I worked down there for like a year. And I didn't see really anything going on, but they just kept digging into the ground, digging deeper into the ground and clearing into the ground. They were building the new Comcast Center. And the reason why I didn't, see things happening right away because it took a long time for people to work through the plans and to dig deep to get down to the bedrock because they were going to go really, really, really high. And sometimes in our haste, we want to build whatever it is, and it might be something good, but we don't take the time to look at the blueprint to make sure that we're doing. And then when God says time to go, hey, go, don't delay. Amen? Have the wisdom to decipher between the two. Let's all stand tonight. I ask you tonight, wisdom or folly? Hey, which is it that you're on? Maybe you need to make some adjustments this week and say, okay, God, the end of 2020, I, I want to be going the right direction as we round the corner into 2021. Let's pray tonight. Lord.